Welcome everyone to Parenting Panel Round 2. We are so excited to offer this virtual version to everyone tonight and we're really, really excited to have a conversation to help people navigate health and wellness with young ones, whether they're kids, whether they're people that are in our lives, nieces, nephews, whether it's students, whatever that connection might be, or the future generation as a whole. We want to make sure that everything that we're sharing in terms of mental health, fitness, and nutrition is empowered and is not going to send anyone in the direction of disordered eating or eating disorders. And that's especially prevalent now in these times when everything is social media and everything is comparisons. We really, really need to make sure that we're watching what we say and producing all things healthy content for our kiddos and the future generation. So today with me, I have the amazing Jill Lewis, who is going to be our representative of all things mental health and how to create that for the future generation. Then I have Desiree Nathanson, who is an amazing fitness entrepreneur and is very informed about how to make sure that things are positive and empowering and nothing is icky and or disordered. And then last but not least, we have JC Pitts, who is also phenomenal, and she is going to be our godsend for all things nutrition and really supporting us in how we navigate food-based conversations with the youngsters. So we'll kick things off. Also, I'm Abby and I own Clarity Fitness, <laughs> which is a body positive gym in Decatur, Georgia. And I personally struggled with an eating disorder. So this topic is near and dear to my heart. And it's really, really important to me and important to a lot of the younger people that I'm in touch with that I navigate wellness in a positive and empowering and not weight-centric way. So that's a passion of mine, and I'm super excited to kick off this conversation. So let's start things off. I would love to know who we all are in terms of our ideal client, in terms of our practice, our background, and just kick things off with a little bit of info and insight. So jump into Jill. Let me know. <laughs> Hi everyone, my name is Jill Lewis. Um, I am a therapist and I own J. Lewis Therapy. We are a group therapy practice based in Atlanta, Georgia, but also have a satellite telehealth office in New York City. And we specialize in the treatment of eating disorders, grief and loss, and perinatal mental health. And we come from a health at every size perspective. We work with long-term clients really wanting to build relationships. We're not a quick fix program. Um, a lot of therapists operate from a behavioral perspective. We operate really based in relationships and understanding your history to your body, your history to food, your history to other people and your relationships. And we really help to navigate how things are playing out today that don't feel healthy or don't suit you. Um, and we collaborate quite a bit with other um, dietitians with fitness instructors and so we're really excited to be here so thanks for having us thank you so thank much you. and jump into Desiree would love background on all of your knowledge as well <laughs> how much time do you have no I'm just kidding uh, <laughs> I am Desiree Nathanson I am owner of Interfusion Fitness which is now a virtual fitness studio um, I am a certified personal trainer registered yoga instructor dietetic technician registered uh, prenatal and postpartum fitness coach, um, and 27 other certifications that I can't even think of right now. Uh, but my focus is to make fitness fun and to make it something that people want to do and enjoy doing uh, because it shouldn't be torture and it shouldn't be something that you hate. Like your body should be, feel good after exercising. Um, and I, like Abby said, I, I like to just keep it positive and stay away from uh, kind of the path that fitness has taken over the past few years with the the whole clean eating um, and just pushing fad diets and, and pushing very unhealthy behaviors and, and toxic uh, verbiage, I guess, uh, that makes people just feel crappy about themselves. So I want people to feel good about themselves again and wherever they are in their fitness journey, whatever body they're in at this particular time, I want people to love it and enjoy it and feel good in it. Awesome. And JC, I would love to hear more about your practice as well as any ideal client breakdowns. And ooh, make sure to come off mute first. Uh oh. Yay. Hey, thanks, Abby. 
I'm JC, and I started Eat Well Georgia in 2013, and prior to that, had worked a lot in pediatric clinical nutrition in inpatient and outpatient settings. Uh, realized that we needed more pediatric nutrition eating disorder services in Atlanta, and so Eat Well Georgia was born. Um, I now have a team of five dietitians, including myself, and we all have a little bit of our different niches and specialties. Um, I'll just speak for myself. I really enjoy working with teens and families. I also work with clients of all ages, um, but I do um, have a special place in my heart for teens and families. I really like to support families um, in, you know, um, unpacking diet culture language within the home and supporting them and giving them tools and resources while they support their loved, uh, their loved one who's in recovery. Awesome. Thank you so, so much. And then I would love to break down separately what constitutes a happy and healthy relationship with food, fitness, and mental health. So obviously um, that's a massive question, but if someone was really new to this realm of body positivity and not triggering eating disorders, really being aware of how messaging comes across. I'd love for each of us to share what our takes are on that. So JC, if you want to kick us off with a happy and healthy relationship for the kiddos around food, that would be awesome. Thanks, Abby. One thing that is, I think I really would like to emphasize is that kids and teens have really high needs for growth. Um, an activity and eating frequent meals and snacks for them is very important. And, um, you know, often kids struggle and become confused when they, when they start hearing diet culture catchphrases or they hear, you know, um, adult restrictive diets that are like low calorie levels that are way below what they need for proper growth and activity for their age. Um, so, you know, I think remembering that, they're still growing and developing. Their brains cannot always absorb abstract nutrition information. And we always talk with, um, with mothers of infants about how fed is best. You know, if a mother's struggling with, do I provide formula? Do I provide breast milk? And I think that's just so true also of um, kids throughout the life cycle is fed is best. We're emerging from a post-COVID world. We're getting back to normal activity. Um, we can't always have home-cooked meals or there may be other stressors, you know, someone may be going through a divorce. Um, there may be a loss and you don't have the bandwidth or capacity to cook at home. That's okay. Bad is best. That's awesome. Thank you so, so much. And jump into mental health. What can we look out for for a happy and healthy relationship with kids in terms of body image, in terms of overall relationship with their wellness journey? And I would love to pass that to Jill. Thanks, Abby. So this is also a really large arena. I think one of the first things we want to pay attention to is that your kids are listening and they're paying attention. So in order for your kids to hopefully have a healthy relationship to food and body, we want it to start with you, right? If you're um, looking in the mirror and you're questioning how you feel, if you're constantly changing clothes and then identifying, hey, I look fat in this and you're making fat this taboo word that is unacceptable when actually it's actually a straight up descriptor of someone's body, right? If you are taking pictures over and over again of yourself and you have to scroll through a million to put them out there, your kids are listening and they're watching and they're interpreting that. So the goal is to have a reframe around it and help your kids know, right? Like this is my body. It does a lot of wonderful things for me. It woke me up this morning. It helped get you dressed. It's taking you to school and acknowledging all the things that your body does do for you rather than looking at it from a critical lens and remembering that you, it's okay to have conversations. If a child comes to you and says, listen, I'm having a hard time in my body. Be curious about it. We don't have to dismiss it. Oh, you're just so beautiful. Let's, let's have conversations and let's have dialogue, right? Because there is something that a kid is probably holding that maybe they've compared themselves to someone else and they want to know that their parents parent can hold and tolerate this conversation with them. So constant communication, being really aware of your own actions around food, right? Like, do you, do you only eat chicken and broccoli, but you feed your kids and everyone else in the family, something different, right? So we always want to be modeling how we want our children to have a relationship to food without taboo talk, without shaming food, without shaming yourself. And if you recognize that that might be a pattern, see, Find, see if you can find small and little ways to just change that, right? As opposed to like, hey, I just took 30 pictures. Maybe like, look at the picture, hold it for a second, but then post it rather than have to make it so broad and like there's something wrong with you. 
that's my recommendation. That's amazing. Thank you so, so much. And I'd also love to get a fitness perspective. I know Desiree coming from a dance background, you've seen it all. So I would love to hear <laughs> your take on what a happy and healthy relationship with movement looks like. Um, I actually have to just, JC totally blew my mind. I always say with um, nutrition, something is better than nothing. And even though I have a toddler like that, I just finished breastfeeding and I kept hearing fed is best, fed is best. And I kept preaching that I have never thought to put it to older kids, to teenagers, to adults. Like you totally, I literally am taking notes right now. So I love that you said that fed is best. Like that's such a good mantra for us as adults too. Um, a big thing with fitness, cause you know, it's Abby, I know you know this um, as a personal trainer as well. Fitness is also nutrition. It's always nutrition. And, um, and my clients that have been with me for a long time have seen my journey, my transition, because I did used to be one of those trainers. It was like, you know, come get a six pack with me, come work off those Thanksgiving calories. And and until I learned how damaging that is and how harmful it is, you know, I didn't know. I, I just did it because that's what the fitness industry did. Um, but I've, I've changed my wording and now I want people to work out and, and this should be everyone. Like we want people to work out to be strong, to be healthy, to be able to do activities of daily living easily. Like exercise should be enhancing your life, not stressing you out. So it's funny, my clients that have been with me for a long time have made that transition with me. And they understand like how important exercise is just to make us feel good about ourselves. Uh, the fitness industry is very good with shaming people and guilting people into working out. My least favorite phrase, well, one of them is no pain, no gain. Like, why is that even a thing? If it's painful, don't do it. <laughs> I mean, it just, it's unbelievable. Like running is, hor it feels horrible to me. I hate it. I can't stand it. However, I've got really good friend, a really good friend who's a race director and loves running more power to her. I do the warmups for her races. <laughs> you know what I mean? So I'm not opposed to running for other people to do it. For me, absolutely not. So exercise shouldn't hurt. Like it's not something you should be using to torture yourself. It's not something that you should be doing so that you can go eat a certain way. Like we eat to live, we exercise to live, food is fuel food, you're allowed to enjoy it. Like Jill said, eating chicken and broccoli all the time, not healthy. Like, yes, they're nu nutrient rich foods, but just eating that food constantly, which is what the fitness industry likes to get people to do to think that they need to do that to, uh, you know, be healthy. No, it's not. And then that's the other thing too, in the fitness industry, it's like, we're constantly being told to do this, to lose weight, do this, to lose weight. Well, why is losing weight always the the goal that we're pushing? Why isn't it be stronger? Because not everybody wants to lose weight or needs to lose weight. Um, and on that same note, it's also stopping your commenting and critiquing of other people's bodies and like, oh my God, you look so good. Have you lost weight? Like we need to stop making that like a blanket compliment because it's not necessarily a compliment and it can actually be damaging because you don't know what people are doing to lose weight or to look a certain way. And you could actually be reinforcing an eating disorder. So, so it all kind of, it just kind of goes hand in hand, like all of the wellness, it's the food, it's the nutrition, it's the mental health. And just knowing that these things should be making you feel better and not stressing you out. And you shouldn't be um, obsessing about them 24 seven. If you're obsessing about them 24 seven, please call JC or Jill, <laughs> cause that's not good. That's a really awesome breakdown. And I couldn't agree more. I definitely learning all of the things in the fitness industry that are just so mainstream that you just don't know that they're not what we need to be paying attention to is the biggest and bestest paradigm shift ever. So thank you for bringing those up. Then next, I want to dive into what some warning signs might be for kids potentially heading down a disordered eating or eating disorder path. Obviously, we're not diagnosing anything. If you see one of these ac activities or behaviors or traits, it's not immediately diagnosed as an eating disorder, but there are just some things that we can keep an eye out for that can give us the light bulb moment to say, hey, maybe I want to send this to someone who might know more about eating disorders or disordered eating. So I want to pitch that one to Jill to kick us off. Anything that comes to mind? 
So I think some of the first things is noticing if your children are getting a little more withdrawn. Um, obviously that can lead to depression, anxiety, which are all components of an eating disorder. But if, um, yeah, if they've gotten a little more withdrawn, if they're even at the dinner table, you can sense a little more anxiety, a little more disconnect, maybe less engaging. Um, if they've pulled away from any friends. Um, also, I know JC and I have spoken about this, right? If We're having a Wi-Fi. Oops. <laughs> Am I? Is this frozen? You're back. Uh, yeah, you're good. <laughs> I don't know if I'm frozen or you guys are frozen. Um, usually it's me. Um, and so noticing that if they're um, if they've been cooking and then they're having a hesitancy to eat the food that they're cooking and they're really encouraging others. Um, and again, the I think the more the anxiety around showing up, going out to restaurants, um, engaging in family meals. Those would be the initial. Obviously, if you find wrappers or an excessive amount of stored food or wrappers in anyone's room, or really a shift of just not eating um, continue, continually, um, and I never want to put it on a body or weight, but if there is a significant shift, whether in gaining weight or losing weight that isn't on the trend of their growth chart, I think those are really important things to look at as well. Awesome. And I'd love to hear, JC, any, anything that might be a red flag in your mind. Yes, thank you. Um, Jill brought up some great points already. So thinking um, further in a like nutrition and behavioral perspective, um, sometimes what I see happen is that clients may go to their annual well child check and they've fallen off their growth curve or there's been a, you know, a change in either direction on their growth curve. Um, that can be a flag to pay attention and, and dig a little deeper. Um, the withdrawal at mealtimes is definitely something that I see a lot. And also something that is really a big red flag is dropping a food group or um, all of a sudden deciding, deciding to eat in a very different way. For example, becoming vegetarian. Not saying that all vegetarians have the potential to develop an eating disorder, but it is, you know, something that can be pretty common. Um, so those are that. And then I'd love to hear what Desiree has to say as well about from a working out perspective. I know that if I have athletes, if they all of a sudden start doubling up on workouts, doing additional workouts outside of their regular practices, that may also be something to pay attention to. Yeah, that's really awesome. Desiree, do you have anything that's coming up in the fitness side for you? Um, well, first I want to say with eating disorders, uh, it's beyond my scope of practice. And, and if you do, uh, suspect an eating disorder in your child don't um, try to look for advice or help on like Facebook or on the internet like it's a very it, it's a mental illness and you need to go to a professional it is well beyond my scope of practice with the eating disorder so uh, JC Jill like <laughs> go to them um, but like JC said with the fitness it's, it's becoming obsessive um, you know just training extra hard um, it's, it's all they think about, uh, even with, with just fitness, like j just becoming obsessive with it. it. It shouldn't be an obsessive thing. Even if you are training as an elite, elite athlete, um, there should still be recovery and their recovery is a huge part. And if someone doesn't even want to be involved in the recovery, then it's beyond just trying to be a better athlete. And there might be something else there. Uh, one thing I noticed um, was uh, picky eating we kind of tend to brush that under the rug as like, oh, they're just a picky eater. Maybe examine that and, and see if it's just picky eating or if you do need to find uh, some help or, or just even consult with an RD. Like you don't even have to bring your child in, just call and ask questions. But when you do have these concerns, go to a professional, go to a registered dietitian who spe specializes in eating disorders. There's a huge difference between registered dietitian and nutritionist. Anybody can be a nutritionist. Uh, and I'm a dietetic technician registered, so I'm like in between. But eating disorders are, are so specific and just, they can be very, they, they're very dangerous and, and you just need to go to an expert for that and not just your friend. That's a really, really good point. And that's actually bringing me to 
another question that I want to pitch your way, Desiree, is what have you seen some parents do that may have not been the best way to navigate that, like we already talked about, or things that you feel like may have triggered? Again, not to point blame, not to make it anyone else's fault or anyone's fault. It's just something that may have started a snowball that may have been unintended. Um, well, it's like I said, we learn, you know, we don't know until we learn. And, and some of these things are just things that you do, because it's what you do. Like I used to say, come work out with me to get, you know, get your six pack, just because it's what I heard other fitness professionals say. And until I learned that that was damaging, I, I didn't stop saying it. Um, but I, I think it comes down to us changing our behaviors and examining what we do. So like Jill was saying with, uh, you know, taking pictures of ourselves, taking 25 selfies, saying we're ugly, or like she said, with, with making fat, this taboo word. No, it, it's, it, it's a descriptor, as Jill said. So just taking one selfie, being okay with it, posting it, because kids see everything, like they absorb everything. Um, if you are saying that you're going to the gym because you want to, you know, have a couple drinks later, you want to go eat dinner at a certain restaurant, we got to knock that out. We go exercise to be stronger. So it's just, I think those are the things that we don't realize. Like I didn't realize I, I, I'm, I'm terrified at, at the amount of people that I might've hurt because of my language, but you know, I've changed and hopefully people have noticed that, but it's our language and, and how we treat ourselves that, that can really be a big factor. Um, and just making sure that we know our kids need to exercise to be strong, they need to eat, to grow and think, <laughs> just exist. And just making it less about like aesthetics and vanity and more about healthy living, like literally being healthy. Awesome. Jill and or JC, I would love to hear either of y'all's feedback and then whoever doesn't answer, don't mind Lola, we'll get the next question, which is what to do instead. So <laughs> whoever feels like they have more to share in terms of the the no thank yous of what we can steer clear on. I'm gonna jump in because I really want to say this before I forget it. Um, something that I see parents do a lot, and again, no judgment, I'm a parent, it's the hardest job I've ever had and ever will have. Um, one thing that I see is the way that foods are categorized as good and bad. And the way that you know processed foods sometimes are um, you know, um, demonized or desserts are demonized. And, you know, kids, again, they have such high energy requirements um, for growth that all foods can work together to promote adequate growth and energy for their activities. And so, you know, I, I would really encourage parents to try to change the language around good and bad foods and to really just focus on variety, whether it be variety of vegetables, variety of ice cream flavors, variety of snacks. Like it's okay for your kids to consume a wide variety of all things. That's awesome. And that's definitely, I feel like that ties into fitness too, in terms of the best way or the right way to work out. There really isn't one. There's so many different ways to move your body. And like you said, fed is best and movement is movement. It's, it all is still yes. amazing. So I love that you brought that up. That's a really awesome point. Thank you. And then Jill, I would love to chat with you about how parents, people, whatever their relationship to the younger generation might be, can really help set the future generation up for an empowered relationship with food and fitness. So instead of the, what don't we do? What are some big time things that we can focus on doing that can make an impact? So the first thing is that we just want to be talking. Right. So the more that we keep either secret or secrecy or shame around something, the more um, taboo it gets, the more we hide from it. So the very first thing that I would do is let's not be afraid to have hard conversations. Um, you know, if we're going to look at Glennon Doyle, right, we can do hard things. So I think that's part of it. Right. If you notice that maybe your child has been a little more withdrawn. We have no idea why, right? Sit down and like check in with them. Hey, tell me a little bit more about what's going on, right? Be explorative, be curious. And if you can, 
obviously as parents, we're going to have certain protections around what we'll share with our children just to protect them, but also our own sense of vulnerability can help kids cope open up, right? Gosh, I, I remember middle school, that was a really challenging time. I had this go on, can you tell me a little bit more about it, right? Making it acceptable to talk about your feelings, how to have these conversations. I think a lot of times we, I know as a parent too, it's like, oh, my kid has these feelings. I really want to make sure that I like contain it, but are the feelings that your children are giving you is so much information. So let's listen to those feelings and let's pay attention to what they're communicating. So open and honest communication. You can always ask for help. I do encourage what Desiree said is maybe we're not going to go to a Facebook page to ask for help. But if you're curious, right, there's so many resources. There's lots of wonderful books. There's people like JC and Desiree and myself who you can consult with, right? Never feel like you have to do this on your own. And I think sometimes that gets a little, um, that part comes out because parents are a little more shameful of themselves that have they done something wrong. And then maybe in the process to protect, they're actually not seeking out help. And the best thing we can do is actually to um, intercept this early, right? The earlier we intercept disordered eating and eating disorder, the best outcome your children will have, right? So even if you're holding any fear or shame, do your best to challenge that and ask for support, ask for help. Even if it's about your child having more depression or anxiety, the sooner we do something, the better the outcome for your child and the less stigma that they hold and the less this becomes any type of identity. So communication, ask for help, be able to tolerate big feelings. And as go back, going back to what JC said is let, let's allow all foods, all foods fit, all bodies fit, all exercise works, right? So not to say don't, not what to, to not what to do, but let's be open to the idea that there isn't something good or bad, that all foods are equal and all, they can all be nutrient to you, nutrients for you. Yay. I love that. And that's, that's so, so, so amazing. I think that that was, that was really the nutshell. Here goes Lola again, but that was the nutshell of what was so important in this conversation for bringing this together was I had lots of parents and lots of people who were um, some type of guardian or some type of peer or mentor to people who were younger. And it, it is very scary to feel like this thing that you don't even understand why or what you're doing, or like we had talked about things that you just haven't had the paradigm shift to yet, how that might be impacting people and just really breaking down the steps as clearly as possible about next steps for support, as well as things that we can incorporate into our lives to make a powerful impact for the future generation is so, so important. So I'd love to hear from JC, anything in terms of relationship with food or routines with food or anything that comes to mind that could be a powerful shift toward not being disordered. <laughs> okay. So, so for families of, of ways they could shift into just more balance and more. Okay. Um, so I just had a thought and it's wanting, just trying to leave my brain. Um, <laughs> So I think, again, going back to um, just the idea of having regular meals and snacks um, and, and recognizing that kids need regular eating opportunities like that to grow and fuel themselves adequately and um, really making those things a priority. Um, even if they have activities, you know, it's you can you can have a, a meal before that and another meal after it if it's a really high intensity activity or a substantial snack. So helping your child learn how to prioritize that and how to fuel around activities um, or not. I mean, just growing is an activity in and of itself. Even if a kid is not, you know, an athlete per se, they still need meals and snacks. And so helping them to talk through their routines of, um, you know, how do I get my meals and snacks at school? I'm always surprised at um, the number of kids that, you know, might skip lunch at school or, you know, when I work with disordered eating or eating disorder clients, they'll always say like, well, I have so many friends that don't eat breakfast or I have so many friends that don't eat lunch. And I just think for anyone, you know, just helping them learn about their body's regular need for food is so important and helping them make it a priority. That's awesome. And that's definitely, I remember, I remember those days personally too. It's, it's like a, comparison of what foods are being eaten and to steer clear of that and to navigate that in a positive way, I think is just so important. So awesome point. Thank you so, so much. 
And last but not least, Desiree. I, ooh, I, oh, see I was just going to jump in with that. <laughs> Sorry, Desiree. Um, this is by no means uh, a judgment or don't do this, but because we live in an age of screens, I think a really important tool is to attempt to eliminate screens while eating. I don't say eliminate screens, right? But we find that when kids aren't attuned to their hunger and fullness as much, it's because they're staring at something else. And so they all of a sudden could have finished their whole meal and never knew they ate it and were never connected to it. So I think in the age of screens, one of the things I do genuinely recommend, and JC can correct me if I'm wrong about this, but as much as we can be present while we're eating, obviously with snacks and so many meals, we're always running around, but trying to be curious about the attunement to your body and not staring at something into oblivion. So you're not paying attention to your hunger and fullness cues. So not all, it can't happen always. This is not an overarching, don't do this, but that would be something that I would encourage, encourage to help kids being a little more attention to what they've eaten, how they've eaten, and how their body actually feels. That's awesome. Yay. Hunger and fullness cues are always an adventure to tune into. So I've been on that journey myself. I know it well. <laughs> That's really important to have the tools to explore that. So thank you for adding that. Awesome. And last but not least, Desiree, I'd love some tools. I know that parents, again, it's, it's concerning to feel like there's all these things I shouldn't do. So I feel like adding things that we can do and can be positive to our lives is super important to have in the conversation too. So anything in terms of fitness? Um, I think we need to, and this is, this is kind of going off on another tangent, but uh, I think we need to start realizing that parenting and life in general is one big experiment. <laughs> like uh, food is a science, nutrition is a science, exercise is a science. And science, as we have found out this past year, is constantly changing. I mean, we should have known it before then, but we really know it now. And if science is constantly changing, then we need to constantly be changing and experimenting to see what works for us. Like I said, with, with the way I talk, I've changed it. You know, and I'm not going to say the way I spoke was wrong. It was harmful, um, but I learned to change my language. So we need to be willing to kind of go with the flow and and maybe experiment and change and, and see if these changes could benefit our family. Um, and this is going to be a, a no thing, but I want to piggyback on what JC said about the good and the bad foods. Clean eating, we have got to, repl I'll say replace that phrase. Because um, clean eating, I people think it's a, a healthy phrase and it's actually, again, one of those damaging phrases because it's implying that other foods are dirty or bad. Um, so instead of, you know, saying like, we need to eat, eat these vegetables in order to have our ice cream. I was just reading a post about this the other day for toddlers. Like maybe there's a day that the kid just wants ice cream for dinner and that's fine. Like ice cream every day for dinner, obviously may not be the most nutritious thing, but we have to kind of remember that what we might've done growing up or what we've seen on TV isn't always the best way to do things. Uh, so just exploring that relationship and, and realizing that all foods are okay. Um, obviously, unless you have like a gluten intolerance or so, like a for real gluten intolerance that you went to a doctor or an RD to have diagnosed, you didn't just diagnose it on your own because Lady Gaga told you. Uh, <laughs> you know, obviously you have an allergy to food, don't eat that food. Um, but just being open to all foods and us ourselves trying new foods. As adults, we get so set in our ways with what foods we like and what foods we don't. Well, maybe we should experiment too. And then maybe our kids will see it. Um, with exercise, do stuff that you like to do. Like Abby, I'm going to disagree. There is a best type of exercise. The kind that you like to do. What? So, so we need to find exercise that we like and that we enjoy. And then we're not coming home complaining. Oh my God, I just went to the gym for an hour. It's horrible. Well, why'd you do it? You know, that, that's kind of weird. So find exercise that you like to do uh, so that your kids will enjoy exercise and, and fitness just becomes a part of your lifestyle. I was super lucky to have parents who just worked out every day, but it wasn't about aesthetics. It was about being able, you know, longevity and, and just living life fully every day without achy knees <laughs> or an achy back. Um, so 
just remembering that food and, and fitness should be enhancing our lives and allowing us to live and not this like constant gnawing in the back of our heads, just like making us crazy. I love that. The, the don't should yourself comes to mind with that, <laughs> all of the shoulds and the guilts and the compulsion instead of what do I actually want and what actually powers up my battery and serves me and feels awesome. So I love that. Even one, sorry, just one really quick. Oh, go for it. <laughs> I was doing because it's just like what you do when you feed babies. When I was first uh, doing solids with my, uh, he's now 15 months, um, and I'd be like, "Ooh, yummy, mm, yum!" And like, well, why am I pushing? Because what if he doesn't like it? Why am I telling him that it's yummy? So it's just like not making it about the food, you know, still having a conversation with him while he's eating. So just like little things like that. I'm like, oh, I, okay. I need to shift that, change the language that I'm using during dinner. So just little stuff like that. It's, we're constantly learning, constantly. That's awesome. And then last but not least, I'd love to go around if there are any resources that come to mind. So I'm a parent and I just figured out that some of these things have really hit home for my kids or myself. And I am just looking for first steps to take. Where should I go? Who should I reach out to? And I would love to pass that to Jill for resources first. Um, so yeah, I mean, I think the first thing is if you, you would want to look for a therapist that specializes in eating disorders, um, also acknowledging hopefully coming from a health at every size perspective. I think most of us land there now, but um, that would be the start. And, and just to know that if you reach out to a therapist, it doesn't mean that you are now bound for life, stuck in a relationship and like, and forever trapped in something, right? You can come and check with us or consult with us. I've had many parents and partners who will reach out and we'll have a simple consultation just to provide them with some tools similar to this of, hey, here's some language, here's some things to pay attention to. So I absolutely think starting um, looking for a dietitian. Um, there are some really great books out there. I know I'm going to probably date myself a little bit, but a lot of times anyone kind of newer into the exploration have always really found Jenny Schaefer's Life Without Ed, even though there, are, even though there's some language in there that might not be quite as... Um, useful today, people tend to feel like that is um, a very identifiable book for them. And so it gives them a sense of understanding and a place. Um, doing a little more research on this notion of health at every size, um, how to embrace more foods, all foods, less shameful um, foods. So that would be the start. JC's probably going to say this too, but also we're going to, we always, always collaborate with, with registered dietitians that specialize in eating disorders and a non-diet approach. Um, there's a handful that we use. We don't use a nutritionist. We don't use anyone else except for someone specializing um, in eating disorders on a, non, a non-diet approach. So that would be the first thing is just to reach out, ask some questions and go from there. And JC, any resources that come to mind on your end? Yes, so I'm thinking about local resources for, you know, kind of Atlanta or Georgia-based folks, and I know that we have, um, Jill and I are both certified through IDEP, so IDEP is, a, um, is um, the international, it's an international um, federation for eating disorder professionals, and they have a pretty rigorous process for getting certified, and there's a Georgia IDEP website that lists certified professionals in, in Georgia. Um, so there's also an international website. Um, so that's a great place to start. Um, we also have a local organization, um, Eden, and that now stands for, it's, it's changed. What is it now? Somebody Education help me. Education and insight on it's eating fine. disorders. <laughs> yeah, so it's myedin.org. That's also a great place to go for resources. Um, for just general pediatric nutrition resources, I like Ellen Satter. It's E-L-L-Y-N Satter. She's a registered dietitian and a social worker. And we consider her, um, her model for feeding to be sort of the gold standard um, as, a, as a starting point or jumping off point for feeding your children. Um, she has some really great resources online. Um, and then I would also say, I, I did have one more and I'm, I, it's, it's leaving my mind. Go to Desiree and then I'll jump in if it comes back to me. Sounds good. Passing okay. it to you, Desiree. <laughs> um, I do want to reiterate once again, because I just want to make sure that people hear this and really absorb it. When it comes to nutrition, please, 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 please make sure you are seeing a registered dietitian. 
it, eating disorders are a mental illness. So nutritionists ain't gonna cut it. Like it's very important. I always refer out the second I even have a hint of an eating disorder. Um, so please, please with the nutrition do that. Fitness is a little harder. Uh, so I'm going to go with things that you can control as a parent, obviously coaches at school, you don't have much control over, but if you are getting a private coach or a personal trainer, um, for your child or your teenager, just pay attention to the language that they use. Uh, you want to make sure that they're not focusing on calorie burning. Um, or like I said, that no pain, no gain mentality. I, I think we're starting to shift away from that. Um, cause I know even a lot of coaches are, are even turning towards like Phil Jackson, right? That's his name, the Lakers guy. Um, like his method of coaching, it's more, he's like the Zen master. So it's more kind. So, so finding coaches and personal trainers who are kind <laughs> and, and are, you know, not, not, not gentle, but just like nice. Like you don't have to be a drill sergeant. If you're going into the army or something, yes, then you need a drill sergeant. But if you're just going for fitness or even training for a specific sport, just find trainers and coaches who are nice and who don't focus on calories and the no pain, no gain mentality. And go to a registered dietitian. <laughs> I remembered my, my last recommendation. So oh. I wanted to second what Jill said about Jenny Schaefer's look. I agree that just over um, my 12 years of practice, I just find that it's a, it's a book that really appeals to people who are really new to recovery and feel really scared and afraid. They can really relate to the language it's written. It's very a very conversational written book. Um, and that feels really nice to clients. Um, another re a book resource I have for parents is a book. It's called, it's the plate by plate approach and it's on Amazon. It's like a yellow book. It's got a bright yellow cover with a plate on the front. And that is a really good tool for parents and um, caregivers if they need to provide more meal support to a loved one at home. That's awesome. Perfect. Well, thank y'all so, so much. Is there any last comments or anything on y'all's mind? Go for it, Desiree. I have one last thing I meant to say <laughs> earlier, um, and this goes for bodies, for exercise, for us as parents, we have to stop. And I think this was mentioned before, we have to stop the comparing because we're all so incredibly different. Our lifestyles are different. Our jobs are different. Our conditioning growing up is different. Our families are different. So we've got to stop the comparing. Um, especially with aesthetics, like we use that a lot, like get this person's butt, get this person's arms. It's not going to happen unless you go back in time and are born to their parents. Like we need to stop the comparing and, <laughs> and just realize we are on our own journey um, as we go through all of this. That's awesome. Thank you. Thank you. Anything else? Any last thoughts? I'd like to echo the comparison um, mm -hmm. thing that Desiree brought up. I actually asked one of my teen clients this week. I said, hey, I'm going to talk on this parenting panel. And can you think of something that would be really important to share with caregivers? Like what's a message that you know, we can give them, a tool that we can give them um, just to help you know, at home? And she said the same thing. She said, please tell parents um, to think about the way they compare us. Um, whether it's, you know, who's eating what or who's good at what, you know, whether it's our siblings or our friends or, you know, who's better in what subject. She's like, just don't. It's just, it's, it's just, it's, it can be damaging. And um, I would like that to be the message that you get them. So. I love that. I'm actually feeling that definitely present in um, some of the coaching calls that I've had recently too. And some of the, the youngsters have brought up thoughts of parents saying, oh, this, this one of your friends is so much more this way and da, da, da. And it's, it's almost bringing up a concern that may not have been there before. And that's, I totally, I couldn't agree more. That's a really, really great point. And Jill, I saw you come off mute. <laughs> I was going to share, um, speaking of exercise, I think Desiree really talked about, you know, finding something that you enjoy. I think on top of that is finding something that you enjoy and works with your body. I've joked for many years, right? Like that people always recommended bar or things like that. And my body and bar just like, do not agree. JC really enjoys bar and that's wonderful, but I prefer circuit training or different types of lifting. And that is what makes my body feel good. And so for so long, because everyone said you should like this, or you should try this, I would do it. And I realized I, I'm not enjoying it. So on top of finding something that feels good and is fun, 
make sure your body likes what it's doing because your body will actually give you cues and signals to let you know along the way. So I think there are wonderful ways that we can actually take care of our bodies that feel good. And I wanted to echo Desiree's no running because I'm an anti-runner. Um, and so I just wanted to acknowledge that there are so many ways that we can actually like it and our bodies will like it too. And they'll, they will communicate that to us. Appreciate y'all so, so much for being on tonight. And thank you, Jill, Desiree, and JC for your amazing input. Y'all are the best. Have a good one. Bye, guys. Have a good night. Bye.